maybe six months, I better say. Uh, Jeff Pasley, uh, uh, Kinder Institute uh, Chair of Early American History. Uh, and first thing I want to say is that uh, Director Jay Sexton, it, I'm about to, for this particular talk, I'm about the fourth string <laughs> introducer because uh, Jay, Director Jay Sexton wanted to do it. And he's out sick. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Alec Reichardt wanted to do it. Alec Reichardt went out. And he's out sick uh, in, a, in a different different way. Uh, uh, they're both they're both out sick. Uh, and there's there was someone else too. But so I'm here. But I'm glad to do it because and I'm going to prove my bona fides by the fact that I have a copy of Christina Snyder's first book with all my close notes. <laughs> so therefore, you know that I'm not just faking. Uh, <laughs> This introduction. So we're glad. We're, it's great to have uh, Professor Christina Snyder today, McGabe, McGabe Greer, Professor of History at Penn State University, or I suppose the Pennsylvania State University, I should say. Uh, uh, Christina is, is an extraordinarily prolific and versatile historian of colonialism, race, and slavery, uh, who. Uh, is really notable, I think, for taking on a bunch of different, uh, difficult topics, but not so much difficult topics in the way that people say that, uh, as just topics that don't kind of fit in to our, our categories uh, in, in the usual way. This one I have posted noted, slavery in Indian country, the changing face of Indian ca of captive in early America. Uh, I guess I guess there were a number of things that have come about come out about slavery among Native Americans, but this was just unusual in the sense that it's the even-handedness. The, the, I think that one of the one of the uh, a couple people said the unflinching way that it looks at uh, uh, as looks at looks at indigenous people as both enslaved and enslavers, and talks about the evolution of it over place and time. Uh, and just incredible in that, in the way, in the, the breadth of its vision. And I think uh, that's something that she's brought to a lot of her work. Her other, her other book thus far, well, the other monograph, I guess, as we say, uh, Great Crossings, uh, Indian Settlers and Slaves in the Age of Jackson, uh, the title kind of doesn't quite do it justice because it's really kind of about uh, Richard Mentor Johnson, one of the, like, a kind of, Interesting, but also sort of figure that people tend to more make jokes about, uh, uh, like the easy figure to send up, uh, and, uh, and a just very unusual take on the Indian removal area in the sense of it's about this is about uh, the Choctaw of the Cherokee, and it's about uh, and it's about Jacksonian Democrats uh, and their ideas about reform rather than from the from the from the from the perspective, the kind of usual New England preacher perspective. That's usually the only one you get that about about that particular topic. So both, and those are both highly awarded books, and I I didn't parse out which one won which, but uh, among the many prizes, Christine has won, Christine Snyder has won, the Francis Parkman Prize, the John H. Dunning Prize, the Berkshire Conference of Women Historians Prize, uh, the John C. Ewers Prize, and a bunch of others, but those first ones I listed are ones that are not easy to get, so you should be very impressed whether you know to be or not. <laughs> uh, you, should be, you should all be super impressed. Uh, I think I did this backwards, uh, but she, she was, was, educationally comes from University of, of North Carolina Chapel Hill, where she studied with the great Theda Purdue and Michael Green, uh, and also taught at Indiana University. Only other one thing I wanted to say, she authored a textbook couple of recent articles that she did that I thought were really great. I actually just recently sent out to my students and some of my actual, actually undergraduate students, so partly to kind of uh, sort of undermine some stuff that I had said about, <laughs> uh, uh, called the Once in Future Mound, Mound Builders from Southern Cultures, which, uh, you know, it's not just about Cahokia, uh, <laughs> uh, about Miss Mississippians. Uh, and another uh, one that I Recommend to all the grad students of many removals from Journal of the Republic. I guess it's a historiographic essay about Indian removal, but uh, it's actually kind of essential. I learned about a number of things that I actually didn't know about um, just earlier this afternoon. So, uh, uh, but I'd like to just now uh, turn it over to Christine Snyder, who's going to talk about just to show the versatility and talk about the state of the West. So, who knew? Thank you. 
that incredibly generous introduction. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, and thanks to all of you for coming. Um, thanks to the Kinder Institute for hosting me and to Jordan, especially for putting everything together. So um, what I'm going to do today is talk about the book that I'm currently working on. Um, and that book is called American Abolitions, The Slow Death and Many Afterlives of Slavery. And um, this book comes out of some of the previous work that I've done, and I'll talk a bit about what inspired me to write it in a minute. Um, but what I'm just going to do, first of all, is, is to tell you a bit um, about uh, some introductory information about the project and what it looks like overall, and then take a deeper dive into the chapter about the Pacific Northwest. Um, so here goes. Even as Wallace and Minerva Burton toiled in slavery, they knew that they were, quote, bound for the promised land. Composing spirituals like Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, and Steal Away to Jesus, this father and daughter anticipated that one day they would metaphorically cross the River Jordan, escaping bondage through emancipation or death. These songs are among the most evocative representations of American slavery, but the Burtons differed from most African Americans in that they did not experience emancipation during the Civil War. Their experience for the River Jordan was the Red River, which flowed near their homes in the Choctaw Nation, a sovereign territory that allied with the Confederacy. Initially, U.S. courts were unclear about whether the Emancipation Proclamation or the 13th Amendment applied to Indian Territory. Certainly, indigenous nations affirmed their own sovereignty. The Choctaw National Council asserted, quote, we do not consent to, nor do we understand the United States as meaning to assume the control or jurisdiction over our national affairs. Later, the Supreme Court would agree, apply uh, ruling that 13th Amendment did not apply to Indian territory. To understand the Burton story, we have to expand our geographic and temporal understanding of slavery and examine a multiplicity of American abolitions. On the eve of the Civil War, Wallace and Minerva Burton were among the 8,000 African-American slaves who toiled in Indian territory. Wallace Burton was born into slavery in South Carolina and as a young man brought by speculators to the Mississippi Territory. Eventually, he and his wife Charlotte were both purchased by a Chickasaw woman named Harriet Willis. In the Chickasaw Nation, the Burtons had two daughters whom they named Minerva and Charity. In 1838, the Burton family, alongside their native enslavers, were forced west on the Trail of Tears. And you can see this is the initial map, of a very early map of Indian Territory, and the Burtons lived near Dokesville. Um, initially, the Choctaws and Chickasaws lived in the same te territory, which is why you're, you'll hear some uh, jurisdictional complexity <laughs> in the early part of the paper. In Indian Territory, the Burton family worked on cotton and cornfields on a plantation in the southeast corner of the Choctaw Nation. In the winter, with less work to do on the plantation, Harriet Willis leased Wallace Burton and his daughter Minerva to a nearby Choctaw Boys School called Spencer Academy. Wallace and Minerva were among 10 enslaved people who at any given time worked at Spencer. While students and teachers lived in whitewashed wooden buildings with upper and lower porches, enslaved people stayed in small huts where the edge of campus met the scrubby oak forest. They built and maintained dorms and classrooms, chopped woods, what chopped wood, did laundry and prepared meals. And as they worked, they sang. Wallace and Minerva sang spirituals of their own composition as they completed daily tasks and at the request of students or teachers, sometimes sang at night to an assembled crowd. Wallace and Minerva split their time between Spencer and the Willis Plantation until 1861, when the violence of the Civil War spilled over into Indian Territory. The Burton family spent most of the war living with missionaries in Boggy Depot. Um, during the war itself, um, the five uh, major Southern nations allied with the Confederacy, um, uh, as well as the Kiowas and uh, Comanches. Um, and during the war itself, Cherokees, Muscogees, and Seminoles all about abolished slavery. 
So this left Choctaws and Chickasaws, um, who saw abolition as inevitable at the war's end, but still they sought to enact it on their own terms. One important thing to note is that the Chickasaw Constitution had an article stating that no emancipation could occur without financial compensation to the enslaver. Um, and this is uh, in a proclamation uh, to the federal government, the Chickasaw Nation suggested gradual emancipation, quote, as soon as it can be done consistently with the mode prescribed in the Constitution. So basically what the Chickasaw Nation suggested was a gradual abolition along the lines of Pennsylvania. Uh, people under 21 had to be apprenticed um, until they reached the age of majority, receiving only food and clothing. Um, and there was a, another kind of suggestion that, quote, middle-aged people were to be paid at, quote, such wages as may be agreed upon them between them and their former owners. And you can see this is part, this is the end of the proclamation. Um, it is believed that such an arrangement will meet the approval of the president and people of the North, it being the self-same plan upon which several, if not all, the original Northern states got rid of slavery. Well, the United States rejected that notion and in the Treaty of 1866 demanded immediate abolition. That treaty also forced Indian nations to give up half their land. In the territory that remained, the United States insisted on unprecedented federal oversight and encouraged corporations to invade. Claiming moral authority as a liberator, the United States extended its authority over foreign people and new lands. Still, the United States provided little aid to freed people. In the aftermath of the Treaty of 1866, the Chickasaws did abolish slavery, but they refused to make freed people citizens. A delegation of freed people traveled to Washington, D.C., requesting that the U.S. support their relocation elsewhere. But the Secretary of the Interior claimed that the U.S. didn't have the money or the land to remove them. A few years after the Treaty of 1866, the Jubilee Fingers, Singers of Fisk University kicked off an East Coast tour to raise funds for education among freed people. Among the attendees was Reverend Alexander Reed, who remembered that the New Jersey crowd were, quote, in raptures, explaining that, quote, such singing was new to them, but not to us. By us, Reed meant himself and his wife, both of whom were longtime missionaries in Indian territory. After the show, Reed congratulated the choral director, Professor George White, who thanked Reed, but lamented that Jubilee singers needed more, quote, plantation songs, end quote, to create a complete program for their tour. According to Reed, it flashed into my mind at once that I could furnish him some pieces, genuine plantation songs, equal to any that I heard that night, and thus help on the cause of education among the freedmen. Delighted, Professor White arranged for Reverend Reed to meet with the Jubilee shortly thereafter. He taught them six songs, all of which had been composed by Wallace and Minerva Burton, the father and daughter who labored at Spencer Academy, where Reed had taught for more than a dozen years. Having no knowledge of musical notation, Reed wrote down the lyrics and then sang the songs over and over until the chorus learned them. The Burton spirituals became among the Jubilee singers most popular, and a few became truly international sensations. Two years later, when the Jubilees toured Europe, Queen Victoria requested an encore of Steal Away to Jesus. <clears throat> Few knew that a family in Indian territory had composed the songs, and fewer still under understood the context in which they were created. So let me turn to the broader stakes of my current book project uh, and talk a, a little bit about how I came to this. Um, so back in 2018, I joined a team of scholars working um, on behalf of the Southern Poverty Law Center and especially their Teaching Hard History Project. So this is a project that provides free curricular materials to K through 12 teachers to help them enhance um, teaching about race and slavery in the classroom. And of course, um, you know, th this curriculum had not been revised in about 20 years and the historiography had changed considerably. Um, of course, once the story of American slavery was safely quarantined in the antebellum South, where it did not threaten a cherished national narrative focused on freedom. 
But mount, mounting evidence from these kinds of books demonstrates that American bondage had a much longer scale and broader scope. So my first book, um, which Jeff very uh, generously talked about, um, joined a wave of scholarship that uncovered slavery in surprising places. Colonial Santa Fe, Ivy League campuses, St. Louis trading houses, Montreal kitchens, Cherokee plantations. And this new scholarship has forced us to reconsider some of the basic, uh, most basic historical questions that we ask, like uh, when is slavery? Where was slavery? When did slavery end? And despite this wealth of new scholarship, we don't yet have a synthetic work that revisits fundamental questions about American slavery and American freedom. And so I tend, intend this book um, to be a, a step in that direction. So it starts with the premise that there were many slaveries. I demonstrate that colonialism over the course of centuries brought disparate, ever-changing practices of slavery into contact across the continent. Still, slavery was inherently unstable, in part because it was contested by enslaved people, dissenting voices from within slaving societies, or rival power, uh, rival powers, including uh, native nations. So there were many abolitions, uh, as well as many slaveries. Um, and these are the abolitions that I'm going to study in my current book project. So basically, I focus on one abolition in each of the chapters. Um, so the Chickasaw National Council, from my introduction, in their short proclamation of 1865, invoked two previous American abolitions, gradual emancipation in the North and the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. So historical actors themselves uh, had an understanding of the long history of American abolitions. Um, the chapters themselves, each one is a case study that looks at efforts to prohibit or limit black or native slavery. Um, and uh, they're kind of grouped into three groups. The first all focus on attempts um, to shape slavery in the early South focusing on that as a borderland space where there are competing ideas about race and slavery among the Spanish, um, Anglos, and also native nations. Um, the second, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the second group here are um, more early American laws um, that are various attempts to um, abolish uh, slavery. Um, first, I focus on Pennsylvania, then go to the Old Northwest, then to Utah Territory. The last two chapters are uh, really deal with the 13th Amendment um, and uh, the kind of afterlife of the 13th Amendment, especially uh, its exception um, of slavery or involuntary servitude as being um, uh, uh, applicable to prisoners. So I look at the abolition of the convict lease in Georgia for that chapter. Um, so yeah, this is kind of what the kind of geographic area and temporal range of each chapter. I'm happy to talk more about that during Q&A. Um, what I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about is chapter six, the third empire, which focuses on Alaska and the Pacific Northwest. This is the chapter that I'm working on right now. So your feedback is very welcome. Uh, as you might guess, this is a new <laughs> spatial area for me. So I've learned a lot. I'm still learning. I'm looking forward to hearing your comments and questions. Okay. In 1869, federal agent James Swan admitted that slavery still existed in Washington territory, saying that although abolition, quote, has thus not far been enforced, it has had the effect of securing to slaves better treatment than they formerly had. His projection for the future was tepid at best. It is to be hoped that in a few years, under the judicious plan of the treaty, slavery will be gradually abolished or exist only in a still milder form. 14 years earlier, in 1855, another American, uh, Governor Isaac Stevens, also proclaimed slavery's abolition in nominally free Washington territory. A generation before that, some British subjects in the region criticized the Hudson's Bay Company for failing to enforce the British Empire's abolition policy, which had been enacted in 1834. Well before that, some Russian visitors to the Russian America Company forts in what is now southern Alaska 
were dismayed to discover that leaders there perpetuated slavery in violation of imperial law, which had banned the practice in all territories in 1805. Count Nikolai Reznov, a founder of the state-owned Russian America Company, who came to audit in 1805, compared indigenous slaves in Alaska to African Americans in the South, writing, quote, they are the true workers of the company. So this paper focuses on the coastal region from Northern California um, to Southern Alaska, where throughout the 19th century, colonial powers vying for control of the profitable, profitable fur trade wreaked havoc on the region, spreading disease, intensifying warfare, and introducing new forms of bondage. Seemingly incongruously, these same empires embraced abolition. In 1805, uh, Russia, uh, in, in 1834, the British, um, the United States with the 13th Amendment in 1865. Um, but slavery persisted into the 1880s. Uh, I look in this chapter at the um, multi-layered history of slavery and abolition along the Northwest Pacific coast in the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, focusing mostly on imperial motivations. I explore how each empire understood slavery and abolition, why they embraced abolition, and how abolition decrees formulated in faraway imperial centers played out in colonial peripheries. In the 18th century, European invaders encountered a vibrant native world well connected by trading routes that extended throughout the Pacific Northwest. As Josh Reed explains, these people clashed over resources, land, and sea space, and in their conflicts took war captives. However, imperial actors escalated conflicts. They, according to Reed, exacerbated older lines of tension, added new opportunities for conflict, and applied their own tools of violence and terror. The first to launch an overseas slave trade in the region were the Spanish, who abducted some native people, mostly children, and took them to New Spain. Although Spain laid claim to part of the region, Russia ultimately established the first long-term colonial presence. Russian fur traders called Promyshleniki first visited the Northwest coast in 1741 and over the next 70 years built a series of forts. From the beginning, the Promyshleniki sought to bind indigenous people. Initially, they kidnapped or coaxed away native slaves war captives or the descendants of war captives owned by the chiefly class. Russians called them cowry from the Kamchatl word care, meaning a driver of dogs or a dog team driver, and in a broader sense, a servant or hired worker. Russians relied on the cowry to help them hunt and fish. Additionally, the Promyshleniki forced cowry to supply them with housing, food, clothing, and tools. Um, this entailed a broad range of work, including constructing buildings and boats, processing and drying fish, butchering whales, gathering roots and berries, sewing nets, rendering blubber into oil, making parkas, and more. Initially, the cowry were paid a small amount. However, conditions deteriorated, pay ceased, and even basic provisions like food and clothing became meager. Many cowry died of exposure, overwork, or hunger. Determined to perpetuate bondage, the Promyshleniki targeted an increasingly wide range of native people, relying on debt slavery, criminal charges, or outright abduction to bind them. Even those who were nominally, quote, free were targeted. In some areas, the Promyshleniki kidnapped a hunter's relatives and held them hostage until the hunter returned with a quota of furs. Promyshleniki forced slaves to follow them from one island to the next, as they exhausted each area's resources. But they did not usually take the cowrie back to Siberia, where imperial officials began to scrutinize their abuses. In 1805, Russia abolished slavery throughout its empire. Trying to position their empire at the vanguard of European humanitarianism, Russia became just the second nation behind Denmark to abolish the slave trade, and the first to, practice the, the first to ban the practice of slavery throughout its dominion. Only a few, few Russian trips, ships patrolled the Atlantic, where they occasionally intercepted a slave trading vessel. The Russian presence in the Atlantic, however, remained largely symbolic, um, but it still bolstered their claim to being a civilizing empire and a peer, or perhaps a moral superior, to other European powers. 
Most of Russia's abolition efforts took place in a very different context, the greater Caucasus in the borderlands between Russia and the Ottoman Empire. So this is the area basically around the Black and Caspian Sea. To Russia, the Caucasus were both strategically and ideologically important. The conquest of the greater Caucasus would give Russia control over sea key ports in the Black Sea, thereby enhancing their economic and military power. Additionally, Russian elites saw themselves, not the Ottomans, as heirs to the Byzantine Empire and claimed Caucasians as their country, countrymen and kin. Caucasians, they noticed, were victims of a centuries old slave trade that targeted Circassians, Georgians and Slavs and sold them in Ottoman slave markets. Promising to destroy the slave trade, Russians claimed moral authority to rule the region. But the conquest proved more difficult than Russian leaders initially anticipated. In the Southern Caucasus, Russia encountered a deeply entrenched slave trade that benefited local elites, giving them access to luxury goods from the Ottoman Empire. Meanwhile, in the Northeastern Caucasus, a resource poor region, an even broader range of people, most adult men participated in slave raids so that they could trade for essentials like iron and salt. In this borderlands region, there were dozens of independent polities, including chiefdoms, khans, and kingdoms. Throughout this region, it was taboo to take captives from one, among one's own people, but many people depended on slave raids that targeted nearby polities. Still, the Russians regarded the abolitionist campaign in the Caucasus as key to building their empire. Starting in 1763, Russia constructed a series of forts, encouraging fugitive slaves to seek refuge there. Though Russian officials hesitate to punish nobles, they sometimes did publicly execute slave traders or send them to labor camps in Siberia. Among Caucasian nobles, Russians encouraged the adoption of European culture, denigrating the supposedly, quote, barbaric customs and oriental vices, end quote, of the Ottomans. Abolition was well underway in the Caucasus by the time it became official policy throughout the Russian Empire. Russian abolitionists sought to counter Ottoman influence in the Black Sea and more broadly to assert Russia as a world power and appear to European empires. Because their own policy was forged in the Caucasus and to a lesser extent in the Atlantic world, Russian abolitionists were not sure what to make of bondage along the Northwest coast of North America. By the time that Russia abolished slavery, the American fur trade operations had been consolidated under the Russian American Company, I'm going to call the RAC. This state-owned company technically owned all cowrie. Uh, Count Nikolai Reznov, who became the who came to audit the company a few months after slavery's abolition, noted that the RAC claimed at least 820 cowrie. 500 men and 320 women and children in Kodiak and Unalaska alone. In response, the company's governing board explained that native elites, quote, donated cowrie, end quote, out of devotion to the Russians, quote, who are quite incapable of doing and do not have time to do the work. The Russian Orthodox Bishop of Siberia and Alaska encouraged a similar interpretation, saying, quote, since baptized Aleutians revered their godfathers as true fathers, they served them willingly and exclusively. The Russians' desire for great profits served as a mean for spreading the principles of Christianity among the Aleuts and eased the work of later missionaries." Unquote. As stories of abuse leaked back to the Russian public, the RAC's practices, especially its enslavement of Christian converts, came under scrutiny. In the 18-teens, as the RAC's grant of exclusive trading powers came up for renewal, the company began to provide more food and clothing for the cowrie, and in 1822, made all cowrie employees of the RAC. Nominally, at least, the RAC had emancipated its slaves. However, as one company manager explained, the pay was only 120 to 180 ruples annually for adult men which was not enough for one person, let alone a family, to survive on. At this time, Britain and the United States also established strongholds in the southern part of this region, what the Hudson's Bay Company, or HBC, called the Columbia District, including parts of present-day Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. 
As Britain and the U.S. vied for political and economic supremacy in the region, President Andrew Jackson commissioned Naval Officer William Slacum as a spy. Secretary of State John Forsyth instructed Slacum to, quote, obtain some specific and authentic information in regard to the inhabitants of the, of the country in the neighborhood of the Oregon or Columbia River. After investigating, Slacom charged British subjects, employees of the HBC post at Fort Vancouver, um, which is now on the Washington-Oregon border, with holding slaves in violation of the 1834 abolition decree. Each settler family at Fort Vancouver, Slacom claimed, held between two and five indigenous slaves. Moreover, the British Empire's official agents in the region, HBC officers, were among the chief offenders. Slacom claimed that the HBC did not merely tolerate slavery. The company encouraged the practice because it cut labor costs in half. Now, certainly Slacom is a biased observer, um, but he got most of his information from Reverend uh, Herbert Beaver, an Anglican missionary whom Slacom met at Fort Vancouver. And Beaver is an HBC employee. He had worked for many years in the Caribbean where both British uh, notions of slavery and abolition were forged. After a few months at Fort Vancouver, Beaver wrote his superiors in London, quote, I have seen more real slavery in the short time I have been here than in the eight and a half years I was in the West Indies. The post had a population of 300 and Beaver over the course of his ministry counted between 32 and 40 enslaved people, eight of whom were held by HBC officers. Beaver reported this grave violation of imperial law to the HBC's governing body in London. He berated HBC officers at Fort Vancouver, claiming the abuses and mismanagement existing here are more than I can narrate, and so great as to effectually destroy all zeal for the service or desire to remain in it. Local officials, on the other hand, characterized slavery as, quote, the custom of the country, end quote, and a, and a mild sort of bondage. But Beaver disagreed. Drawing on his previous experience in the Caribbean, he argued that whether on a plantation or a fur trading post, quote, discipline is maintained by the use of the lash and the cutlass, supported by the presence of the pistol. At Fort Vancouver, he noted that occasionally there are, quote, scenes of atrocity which make the blood run cold. While Beaver's reports sometimes revealed humanitarian concerns about slavery, he was primarily concerned with the well-being of British subjects, himself most especially. Beaver sneered at Fort Vancouver and its inhabitants, calling them, quote, absolute heathens. That category included the Post's many Catholics, who were, French, who were chiefly French Canadians or Métis. Beaver described Fort Vancouver as a profoundly unchristian place, explaining to his London superiors that the main problem with perpetuating slavery was that it, quote, added to the existing depravity of our society. In reality, Beaver likely contributed to the problem. Beaver and his wife, in addition to demanding a double wine ration, refused to be, quote, employed in menial offices. Members of the British upper class, they demanded that the HBC provide them with a body servant. That servant, that quote servant, was a 14-year-old Indian boy, never named in the documents, at least I haven't been able to find it so far, who might well have been a slave. And his services were not quite enough. The Beavers repeatedly lobbied the HBC unsuccessfully for another servant, ideally, quote, a female attendant, end quote, who excelled at laundry. Despite the limited nature of the Beaver critique, his reports prompted the HBC's governing body to demand answers from Vancouver Post Commander James Douglas. The, Frank, uh, the, the commander frankly admitted that the effect of abolition, quote, has scarcely been felt here. And I fear that all of my efforts have virtually failed in rooting out the practical evil, even within the precincts of this settlement. In truth, the HBC had no authority outside of their posts although they did try to liberate white and Japanese captives. Even within the post, Douglas's efforts seemed to have mounted to an instance or two of protecting people who fled their enslavers. Additionally, Douglas claimed that most enslaved were, known, were owned not by British subjects who worked for the HBC, but rather their native wives, 
In some cases, this may have been true, but as one critic pointed out, quote, these women who are said to be the owners of the slaves are frequently bought themselves by the men with whom they live when they're mere children. Of course, they have no means to purchase until their husbands make the purchase from the proceeds of their labor. But no matter how enslaved people came to live at Fort Vancouver, Douglas asserted that they were better off there than being, quote, turned loose in the forest. Alexander Kubinay Ispister disagreed. Ispister, a Métis man from Rupert's land, worked for the HBC for four years. He asserted that bound indigenous people in the Pacific Northwest were, quote, absolutely slaves, end quote, just as those in, quote, the slave states of America were. Ispister argued that in addition to holding individuals as slaves, the HBC compri compromised the freedom of all native people in the region through its trade monopoly. Quote, occupying a territory comprising a superficial area nearly one third larger than all Europe, it reigned supreme covering 50 native tribes of Indians who are the slaves of its law and policy and scarcely removed by that, by in name being its actual bondsmen. In a widely circulated uh, 1846 pamphlet, Ispister cataloged the HBC's abuses, arguing that the company should reform or that its monopoly should be terminated. Ispister wrote the pamphlet after he immigrated to Great Britain to act as a delegate for his people. There he joined two important reform societies, the Aborigines Protection Society and the London Emancipation Committee. As a Métis delegate living in London, Ispister doubtlessly drew on his own experiences as an HBC clerk and the lectures he heard about Atlantic slavery to offer a powerful critique of colonialism. Meanwhile, Herbert Beaver, the Anglican missionary, presented his report at least twice to British anti-slavery societies in London. U.S. citizens like the spy William Slacom seized on Beaver's reports to argue that Britain, either too weak or too apathetic to enforce its own imperial law, lacked the moral authority to rule the region. Slacom declared, quote, as long as the Hudson's Bay Company permit their servants to hold slaves, the institution of slavery will be perpetuated. In a report circulated to both houses of Congress, Slacom laid out ambitious visions of American empire. By establishing a custom house at the Puget Sound, the United States could break the HBC monopoly and supply a network of US-based whalers across the Pacific Ocean. US loggers could harvest, quote, the finest timber west of the Rocky Mountains, end quote, along the Rogue River, while farmers and ranchers in the Willamette Valley could provide the entire West Coast with wheat and beef. In this fever dream of a congressional report, Slacom linked abolition and imperialism but he also revealed a flaw in the plan. Slacom had assured British subjects that their preemption rights would be recognized, that the US would only expand their economic fortunes, not compromise them. With this offer, Slacom echoed the promises inherent in the North Northwest Ordinance, which lured Francophone residents of the Old Northwest um, by promising that the United States would protect their property rights, including their ownership of enslaved people in a nominally free space. Indeed, very little changed when the Oregon Territory became part of the United States. Even after the passage of the 13th Amendment, the United States was not the great emancipator it's, it claimed to be. Based on his experiences as a fur trader and justice of the peace in Vancouver, um, a, a Brit named Gilbert Malcolm Sproke claimed that the influence of American fur traders into the Pacific Northwest led to an increase in the enslavement of native women forced into the sex trade. Sprout admitted that similar conditions existed on the Canadian side of the border. In the 1870s, um, British Indian agents, I'm sorry, Indian agents in British Columbia affirmed that they had not eradicated slavery, but the superintendent ordered that, quote, all the slaves are not to be called slaves, but Tanas men and Tanas men, meaning uh, little men and little women. U.S. Indian agent James Swan also sought to downplay the severity of slavery, at least rhetorically. The condition of enslaved people in the Pacific Northwest was, quote, a mild kind of servitude. Their status, as compared with the African slavery of the southern states, is rather that of bond servants. They are the hewers of wood and drawers of water. 
Slavery did come to an end in the 1880s, but indigenous people, not imperial agents, took the lead in eradicating it. Anthropologist Leland Donald has identified three major factors. Native people self-emancipating by seeking refuge with other indigenous groups or at settlers' forts. Secondly, the decline of intertribal warfare. And third, indigenous nations strengthened efforts to adopt war, cap war captives to recover from population loss. So as I wrap up here, and we kind of look at the, uh, I think what we generally imagine to be the geography of slavery, uh, I wanna draw several conclusions from this comparative perspective on the history of abolition in the Pacific Northwest. So most obviously, the United States was one of several empires that claimed to abolish slavery in the 19th century. The US was the third abolitionist empire to establish lasting outposts in the Pacific Northwest and had much in common with its predecessors. Embracing the greatest humanitarian cause of that era, all three claimed that abolition, among other factors, gave them the moral capital to extend their empires. However, because the Russian, British, and US empires were so vast, they cont contained multiple forms of bondage, emerging out of vastly different cultural contexts. In each case, imperial officials fixated on slavery in specific locales. For Russia, the Caucasus. For Britain, the Caribbean. For the United States, the American South. These were the theaters of heated debate within each empire, the prime battlegrounds of emancipation. Hence, empires formulated laws and strategies to deal with eradicating slavery in specific places. And they had a difficulty um, migrating those laws and strategies to, to new places. And meanwhile, they all tolerated or encouraged other forms of bondage, including serfdom, indentured servitude, and penal slavery. Imperial notions of slavery and anti-slavery broke down at the far corners of their dominion. Administrators professed difficulty understanding local dynamics, both indigenous and previous imperial practices of bondage. Most often, imperial officials at far-flung colonial outposts concluded that because local practices differed so greatly from their own notions of slavery, they were less severe, perhaps even beneficial to colonized peoples. However, some settlers or traders who witnessed bondage firsthand sounded the alarm, alerting their superiors. But imperial leaders spent little time and few resources investigating, much less developing a broader plan for abolition or perhaps multiple abolitions throughout their empires. Power deferred to local authorities, many of whom benefited from indigenous enslavement. In some cases, local authorities simply applied new terms to the enslaved without changing anything about their condition or labor. As this paper demonstrates, hopefully, the process of abolition in the Pacific Northwest was protracted, uneven, and more dependent on local dynamics than imperial law. Thank you. Any time for questions? Go ahead. Long history of enslavement in the United States and uh, many movements to abolish this as a community. How some of those came to fruition? Why do you think that even recently, as recent as last year, states like Louisiana have voted to continue to allow enslavement of people who are incarcerated to continue? Yeah, I mean, part of um, the conclusion of this book, I, I uh, I mean, convict labor is still with us, right, as a legal form of slavery or indentured servitude, and many states do this. Um, I actually, I'll go back to this chapter. Um, I, I, I was an undergraduate at the University of Georgia, and when I was thinking about this project, I remembered that as an undergrad, I had heard that uh, prisoners built Sanford Stadium, which is like the big football stadium on campus there. Um, and it was true, basically, that they had they had uh, done explosives, graded, excavated the initial site, and they'd done some of the finishing work too, and and many, many, many other projects on campus. So I think that this labor is all around us. It continues today. For the conclusion uh, of the book, I do want to talk about the carceral state today, and um, probably focus on. Um, 
incarcerated firefighters in California um, as people who are still doing this incredibly dangerous, difficult work and who are not being uh, given opportunities um, to, you know, uh, advance, the, you know, this idea that labor is beneficial and that it disciplines and that it can open up job opportunities because they later cannot work as firefighters. Um, so obviously, I mean, I think this is still a problem. This is, I think that um, your question is the same question that I kind of struggle with. Like, but I think that part of the answer is, is seeing slavery in lots of different contexts and understanding that it's dynamic and that it takes a lot of different forms. And that also things that are disguised as reforms like prison reforms can often perpetuate those inequalities that support white supremacy. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, thank, thanks, this is such a fascinating talk. Um, I had a question, and it sort of actually builds on this about um, thinking about kind of comparative histories of after lives of slavery. So I'm an Africanist, and I've been, this is sort of selfish because I've been working on a chapter. <laughs> but, um, like, it seems to me that it's part of what the work that you're doing shows is that the history of kind of capital disguises for a long time, like coercive forms of labor. But I guess I was interested in, because so, you mentioned, you know, with this Russian, like war captives, in the way that that accelerates um, both Indian nations taking captives and the way it's really transforming society, right? Because it's it's true that there's, like every example that you could look at, the history of revolution is amazing and fantastic. Mm -hmm. But I guess, kind of, what does it look like for many of those nations? You know, so how does it reorder? Because in a lot of the context, it totally reorders country. Uh -huh. You have three and four mile linear spines. And does that look like for these nations? Like, do can you trace those sorts of things? Like, do people do these in their own histories of themselves? So, or maybe there's another dimension in which they're doing this, and it's not this kind of one-to-one -one comparison. But I just, it's, I'm just really curious to hear you speak about that. Words. Yeah, thank you. And I think that like comparative aspect, I've taken a lot of inspiration from scholars working in other places, mm -hmm. um, in Africa, in the Middle East, mm -hmm. and um, people working on just the British Empire and its relation to relationship to unfree labor. So yeah, you're absolutely right that that. Um, there is this complex interplay between like imperial law and indigenous customs, right? Because um, this does start in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, like Josh Reed says, like there are war captives before this. And actually the Pacific Northwest is the only place that we know of in native North America that had transgenerational um, ideas about slavery. That is, they can pass from one generation to the next and other American Indian societies, it's this is a condition that lasts at most for the lifetime of one individual and does not really pass on. So like there aren't, I mean, um, it, in terms of native societies, it, it varies quite a bit in terms of if there's a stigma or not attached to being uh, like a, a child of a slave. Um, but those, some of those names do survive and it's more intense in the Pacific Northwest than it is in other parts of Native North America because of that transgenerational aspect of slavery. So there's still a memory of this and it still like affects how, what people talk about in terms of who should be eligible for tribal council and yes, things exactly. like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's, imagine, yeah, it's, it's the same in the context. Yeah. And, and it has, that has a lot in common with other post-slave societies. Like, is there a stigma of slavery? What forms does that take? Um, so here, and I'm not like, uh, I am trying to be, to read the evidence and see what people on the ground are saying. Um, but, you know, there is a way in which colonists both accelerate this practice and distort it and make it into something new. And at the same time, try to regulate native people's behaviors. So it's complicated. Um, but, but a lot of it is about colonialism. Um, and at least on the surface, projecting ideas about what civilization is and what um, the kind of values that the United States is spreading. Yeah, thank you. But yeah, thank you for your question. Could, could you, I guess the, the thing that when you have this such a big, such a large s scale for this, you start to see that, uh, I guess at what point does, I suppose it's the 17th century or something, it seems like, like calling something slavery is like this. There's a world of captivity and like very well, poorly paid labor, you know, 
mostly on free labor is, is pervasive. Mm -hmm. But at some point, they start calling it slavery. And then that becomes something that's really like it's politically actionable. Like mm -hmm. everyone, the people calling someone else it's slavers are trying to get benefits from it. They're trying to get benefits from it. But like, among who and how? You know, how that, I mean, you know, it's like, well, when does that, how does that work? You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. Russian, you know, but I, I guess I didn't know the Russians were going to be slaves. Okay. Yeah. You know, like, 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 uh, when, 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 <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of slipperiness with language, like dealing with this field. And so part of the reason that I initially I thought of this project as a way to talk about different forms of bondage that existed in North America. And that it still in a way is about that. But by talking about abolition and like specific instances of abolition, then I'm letting the actors on the ground argue about what slavery is and what slavery means and, and what it says about them as a people, you know? And so I try to contextualize that um, for all these different folks. Well, and a lot of it is like highly politicized, but I would say like, I think that we often think about this kind of project of moral capital is something that comes out of maybe the enlightenment but i think even in this the first abolition of, of spain like thinking about how they're creating a civilized and christian empire like it goes back to the 16th century at least i'd say but maybe ancient historians will tell me that even further. yeah i don't know if we have any there i bet they probably would but uh I, well it, it's i mean it's clearly it's important though at some point where they you know, the word slavery as we use it now gets deployed, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and I guess, I guess, are you, I mean, I know you're, you're cataloging, are you, are you, do you want to feel like you want to take a position on so one, one level, you say, oh yeah, well they talk about, everyone who goes around talking about abolition is looking, actually looking to enslave everyone. And I guess, <laughs> is that what, mm. they're looking to not explain, you know, they're looking to take over their land. Uh, you know, it's a way to undermine, it's a way to undermine other people is uncivilized, so you can seize their stuff. And that's a lot of it. I do think that there are a lot of different actors involved, and I think there are some very sincere actors, and, yeah. and then some, yeah. So, um, but there is a lot of just crude, you know, like political or economic calculus going on here. So, um, I, I mean, I think, for example, if we take like the Third Empire, I mean, you have both. A Métis man who's like an intellectual and very influential. I think actually in his writing, sometimes he's reaching for that word slavery because he knows it'll grab people's attention, you know? Um, and he's kind of an insider outsider because he, he was an HPC employee, he's also Métis. Um, but it, it is interesting, I think, the degree to which people who are benefiting from the Russian America company are like calling out the company on its unethical but highly profitable practices. So, I mean, I do think that there are some sincere actors involved. I think many of the missionaries involved had, you know, um, some kind of belief about a unified theory of humanity and so forth. Um, but I think there is a disturbing amount of political calculus whereby in all of these cases, even when um, certain kinds of bondage, uh, whatever comes to be defined as slavery is targeted, that there's a high tolerance for other kinds of practices that they're short of that. They're short of that. Yeah. Yeah. But they, they, it's much easier to define slavery narrowly and also to apply abolition narrowly. Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess one thing that I would, one suggestion that I would have is like, think about like, what, what are the characteristics? Mm -hmm. You know, can you identify like what gets, what works to apply that? Cause they clearly, they all, this is slavery, that isn't it. Slavery is really bad and we'll take it, you know, you'll be punished for, for, for doing slavery, but what's, what's the, what are the how, how does it define? Because it gets very, I mean, it's easy, it's easier to see, okay, it gets racialized. Mm -hmm. so let's move on to the Northwest. Yeah. And I guess it's what it's uh, I mean, <laughs> I think like just fundamentally in all these cases, 
that we can just define slavery as an idea that people can be reduced to a category of property. So, you know, no matter what else is happening, I think that's true in all these cases and even in the indigenous society cases. Um, and I think, you know, captivity is a much wider variety that um, gets much more difficult to define. But I was honestly surprised at how often people in this Alaska chapter, they just said slavery. They didn't, you know, they're mostly not using euphemisms. Um, so. That would make sense in the 1860s. Yeah, I guess so. We should let someone else talk. Sure. <laughs> who else who, who else has a question? Go ahead, Bill. Um, I'm curious, uh, when you have a uh, successful abolition movement mm -hmm. and you declare slavery invalid, what happens to the slaves? I mean, how do you yeah. deal with them? I mean, what do they do? How can they integrate into the society at all? Yeah, this is a good question, and this is something that all these different abolitions deal with. And so part of what I wanted to do with this project was to put the 13th Amendment in a broader context. And so some of the, I mean, there's a lot of Civil War era scholarship right now about how protracted that battle for emancipation was um, and, and all of the questions that it left unanswered. Um, and, and what I would say based on this is like, this is, a, these are very old questions and questions that people um, who were involved in colonizing North America or living in North America um, have not resolved very well. And I think even given all those things, the 13th Amendment was the most successful abolition. Um, but there are many previous attempts at it, right? So um, I, I think to get back to your question, many of these are just wildly unsuccessful. <laughs> um, that very little is done. I mean, so part of the question too is how do you enforce abolition? Well, what resources are you actually willing to expend to make it happen? And then, like you said, what happens to formerly enslaved people? I mean, these are people who don't have property, right? Have often been severed from their kinship ties and all kinds of things. Um, so, you know, some of these abolitions never really come to fruition. I also do want to show some like more ground up action. So like in this War of Independence chapter, I start with the Lord's Proprietors of Carolina who try to restrict Indian slavery in South Carolina. Not that effective. Um, but I also uh, take that through the Yamasee War to show how native actors, they're the ones who actually destroy it, you know. And what happens in that context to formerly enslaved people is very different than what happens to like formerly enslaved people in the North. Um, through like that process of abolition is so slow and so protracted. Um, so yeah, I'm still working through these. This is a really good question. And I guess my what I would say preliminarily is the United States has so much in common with other post-slave societies and it does not deal very well with what's on the other side of abolition. So I have a question that's kind of a marriage, I think, of, of a part of the answer that you just gave and maybe some of the stuff uh, that Jeff was asking about, which is which is terminology and kind of lumping versus splitting, right? Thinking mm -hmm. thinking, thinking of this as, um, as all kind of about the institution of, of slavery, whether it's called slavery or not, and what difference it makes if it's called something else, or if mm -hmm. people have the ability to lay claim to a different kind of freedom. Mm -hmm. And that freedom that isn't yet quite slavery, right? So thinking about freedom as existing on kind of the spectrum. And I've spent a long time thinking about um, the folks in, 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 in the, the North who are free by our emancipation statutes and occupying this nebulous category. They're often referred to as term slaves mm -hmm. because they're to be set free at a certain point or indentured servants who are supposed to serve for a period of time and then be set free. And thinking about, as we talked about, about the ground up, up like how it about mm -hmm. what difference it makes. So Jeff was asking how, how enslavers or slaveholders are using these distinctions, like when we're calling this slavery mm -hmm. versus we're calling this something else, right? Mm -hmm. In order to maybe get something, right? Mm -hmm. But what difference does it make for the unfree people, yeah. whether or not they have access to a different kind of status, status that isn't slavery, but a status that is indentured servitude, a status that is term 
a status that is in this kind of nebulous realm uh -huh. where they haven't unambiguously been reduced to enslavement. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is a really good question. Thank you. Um, and I, I will say, like, so starting with the kind of um, people on the ground, people who are actually enslaved. Um, I think that part of the, what if this project has to do is like, how are they defining freedom or, or the absence of slavery? Because that definitely changes over time too. So like, um, and I think the, the gradual abolition in the North is a great example of that. So, and I think there's been great scholarship about what is the meaning of freedom? How, and, and I, there's a, um, an African historian, Khaled Essesaya, who works on um, Mauritania, slavery in Mauritania. And so he distinguishes between abolition and emancipation um, by saying that abolition is, are imperial decrees and emancipation is the process by which people free themselves, mm -hmm. which I think is a useful distinction. And so part, I wanna like draw on that inspiration in this work um, because yeah, what would it actually mean to be free? Like people who, are forced into convict labor in Georgia. Many of them had been born into slavery um, where their parents had. Um, and so, yeah, from like that kind of experiential perspective, what does it actually mean? And I mean, I think, you know, this is a project that really threatens to just get completely out of control. <laughs> and this is the only way that, I mean, this is the, if you guys have other ideas, let me know. But this is the best way, like, by connecting it to um, specific abolitions. I feel like this is the best way that I've come up with to try to tie it together. So what I really focus on, what are the people, um, you know, what are these either states or colonies or empires calling slavery? And I do talk about how narrow it is, but I, I largely don't get into like the messy middle of uh, what, I mean, I do a little bit of that, but um, but I guess the way that I, that I try to do it is show people who, for example, this, the Utah chapter is pretty good because what, the Utah Legislative Assembly claims to be doing is destroying the kind of um, uh, slavery that had existed under the Spanish Empire and Mexican um, nation after independence and claim that they're going to redeem these native captives. Um, in reality, they do create a different kind of bondage where most children are held in bondage for life. Um, so, you know, what does that actually mean for people if they don't outlive their terms of bondage? You know, if they don't, if they are not meaningfully incorporated into society. Um, so yeah, I, I, I know this is something that, I, that I'm definitely working on, but I do wanna keep in mind like what, what how are people trying to make themselves free? And, Adventurous stories, you can probably come up with a bunch of other abolitions that you should do, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was, yeah. Three or four or five other chapters. But we have a question from uh, Jay Sexton. Jordan in his phone has Jay's question. Can you do his voice? Okay. <laughs> it's long. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. He said, love this lecture and so much mileage and idea of multiple North American slaveries and abolitions whose stories are site specific. My question is how these local stories are all tied together. Jeff seemed to be saying that there was a rhetorical and political link made by historical actors at the time. I wondered if the key link is to be found in the uneven economic integration of the long 19th century, the gradual yet incomplete imposition of market capitalism, the infrastructures of exchange that linked some places but not others, the convergence of commodity and labor prices and in integrated markets but not in self-sufficient zones, etc. All of which explains both the march of abolition yet the messiness of the story. Wow. <laughs> Could you like copy that and send it to my email? I probably need to come back to that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think the economic side, that's, uh, well, I will say like, I think there, there are um, what links these, like I wanna use each chapter to bring out a different theme. And, you know, there was a suggestion, like I could have thought of, some of these chapters, I think, had to be in there. Like, I definitely had to focus on 13th Amendment and the Northwest Ordinance. Um, but for some of these others, I could have swapped them out for, like, for example, in thinking about um, 
the uh, Lords Proprietors of Carolina and their attempt to abolish Indian slavery. I could have easily done a chapter about the Pueblo Revolt or King Philip's War, which were also like intimately linked to enslavement. Um, but uh, part of what I want to do is, is um, I mean, to talk about how empires are talking to one another. And these three chapters are very closely linked because, um, yeah, those kind of like the Lord's proprietors were influenced by Charles V and the fallout of the Yamasee War leads to the establishment of Georgia. Um, so, I mean, I think at this point, um, what I'm kind of looking to are the historical actors and the way that they reference previous abolitions or their aspirations in terms of, um, you know, competing politically or economically with um, their rivals. So I've only written a third of the book, but uh, I will cut and paste those comments and read more about them. <laughs> Do you have anything on Jay's uh, uneven capitalism? Oh my God, no. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that's really interesting. I am not an economic historian. Um, I, I think that one thing that strikes me in thinking about this project is like the ubiquity of a lot of these practices. I mean, how, how well or not well they're integrated into global economies. I mean, there's a lot of similarity really. Across the different. Across the different, different spaces, places. yeah. That's and like the California thing in the conclusion, if I'm gonna talk about, I could have easily written out about Georgia, Iowa, Probably Missouri. I don't really know specifically Missouri, but um. sure. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Stop a little bit more, Jonathan. Sure, I'll jump in. I, this is not a terribly well formulated question, but um, it seems there's an interesting tension with empire here, mm -hmm. and you're obviously saying a lot about empire, so I guess this is an invitation to speak more about it. There's a capacity in imperial or territorial space to either use the authority of the United States sort of carte blanche to demand the end of slavery or to allow a kind of shadow slavery to go on. Mm -hmm. I suppose reverberates with the decay of the United States institution as its territory for the actual liberty of the actual mechanism, constitution seeking to trigger Puerto Rico's admission. The union is remain territory. So on the one hand, sort of dictating the Choctaw, no, you don't get to mm -hmm. emancipate gradually, but also just allowing kind of indefinitely a kind of slavery to persist mm -hmm. in imperial space in the Pacific Northwest. And that also made me think of Utah, which you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. The United States government is not allowed in Utah to join the union until they renounce polygamy, entirely basing that case on the fact that we in slavery. Right. It would be yeah. inconsistent with the Civil War and the Civil War and everything the Republican Party has stood for. Mm -hmm. If you allow the state admission of the Union to continue to tolerate the practice, just a lot of people then claim it's ridiculous to have yeah, yeah. Annie's point to call it in slavery. You're talking about historical <laughs> definitional work. Well, the Democrats said yeah. that about Republicans all the time. Claiming this. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Um, that isn't necessarily out of the question, but it seems that there's this interesting there's this capacity with imperial space mm -hmm. um, to either use the, the shadow of slavery to destroy practices in yeah. the or to say, well, the 13th Amendment only really applies to the United States, not its territory, or something, which is ironic given the prior issues it, it is yeah so this is a great question and i and i think part of it it is about um like i think this idea of moral capital is is very powerful right and, and so i'm drawing on like chris brown's work here um but it is like defining self and defining other and like who belongs and who doesn't belong and it's somewhat capricious right i think the ways in which it's applied um are very uneven and are very dependent on these spaces with very specific histories. And 
And a lot of it is geared toward um, benefiting local elites, right? Like if local elites are benefiting from continuing slavery by binding Indian children, and they're the ones who are supposed to be enforcing policy on the ground, like, is it actually gonna happen? Um, there are some other scholars from like global history of slavery who say, you know, if abolition is gonna be enforced, then it takes a community, right? And if slavery is gonna be practiced, it takes a community. And so I think one thing that I see in the study is like persistent localism and the way in which that locale engages with the broader empire, you know, so like how much authority do people have on the ground and how much do the imperial actors care about, like, is this an important space? Is this actually worth dealing with? And I think in the case of Indian territory, that's the place where you see most thoroughly in the West, the application of the 13th Amendment. Um, and it has to do with extracting those resources and punishing those nations. Um, but you, but in other spaces that are much less integral, um, yeah, there's just, it, I mean, there's a kind of cold calculus, I think, of like, is it worth it? There's no Freedmen's Bureau in the West, like as flawed as those things are, right? It, it, is a, it is a kind of institution that is supposed to enforce emancipation. Um, so yeah, that may not be like exactly um, responding, but those are my thoughts right now. Thanks. Just a time for one more. Uh, Aaron? Um, thank you for this talk. It was really interesting. Um, what you were saying about emancipation a few minutes ago um, kind of triggered me to think about uh, Chris Njopra's book, Black Ghosts of Empire, mm -hmm. and how he talks about emancipation ultimately failing because it just re reinforces these systems of white supremacy, these ideas of a racial caste system. And I have a student who's been working on amelioration right now. And through the, the path that you've traced, I'm wondering if this, and this might connect to Jonathan's point about um, kind of moral capital, if it's not, if we can't see slavery kind of morphing in each place to become more acceptable and become more palatable. Because that's, uh, so I work on colonial South Carolina and spent way too much time with the fundamental constitutions. But there's there's so much in there where it's like, we're gonna do this better. Um, like, it'll it'll be okay when we do it. Mm -hmm. We'll come everybody else for doing it and we'll come up with a better way to have slavery. Mm -hmm. And it seems like at each step, you're, you're kind of tracing these local experiments to say, okay, how, how much do we have to take away from this to balance profit with being mm. able to live with ourselves? And I'm wondering if that's not kind of making the point that this can only happen at a local level mm. as opposed to having a kind of natural discussion. These are, this is a very smart idea. Um, We'll have to talk more about colonial South Carolina, but I, but like I think you're absolutely right that all that these practices are always dynamic, that they are never stable because they're constantly being challenged. But especially this kind of interaction with the state, um, it that is that is a moment at which um, these practices are especially likely to be dynamic and to change um, and to you know, fit whatever guys work best with some kind of um, alchemy of local um, demand, you know, the people who are in power or the people who are overseeing the administration of that colony or state. Um, yeah, and what, what satisfies the metropole or what satisfies the edict. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right about this being kind of a moving target and, um, Yeah, I'm just gonna have to think about that more, but that's a great point. Thank you. Well, it could be time to have to have a drink. Let's so. <laughs> uh, uh, let's let me let me just say before we uh, before we do the applause that you should definitely come back next week for Professor Jared Roll from the University of Mississippi. Uh, well, to challenge the New Deal, contemporary life is here. Organizing campaigns. Business always alive, always alive. <laughs> <laughs> I won't make any comments. Any comparison? Yeah,
other friends. <laughs> Christina Snyder. <laughs>